All right, 1230, good afternoon. So welcome back. All right, we were talking about uh, propositional logic on Wednesday and conditional statements and converses, inverses, and contrapositives. And if false, then anything and truth tables and I think we ended up somewhere around truth tables and biconditionals and we're just going to keep building on that so any uh, questions before we jump into this okay Correct. So what about for like if one thing implies the other? Can you explain that? Like sure. Um, so all right, so implication versus equivalence. Um, they are different things. So here's an example of implication. P R O Q. So we, we think of this as saying if P then Q. Okay, so um, if X is less than 5, then X squared is less than 25. And this is for positive integers. All right, so that's an implication. Um, And it turns out for this particular p and this particular q, um, if x squared is less than 25, then we also know that x is less than 5. So in this case, p and q, they have identical truth values. Okay, so they're, they're equivalent. Um, but here's, here's a different pair. If x is less than 5, then x is less than 10. So this is P and this is Q, and clearly P implies Q. But P is not equivalent to Q, right? Because for example, if X is seven, then Q is true, but P is false. So to say that two things are equivalent means that they have the same truth table. It means that in all cases, they're either both true or they're both false. Okay, and we also write this with a biconditional, P if and only if Q. Oh, lots of chiming going on. Someone must have mentioned the free pizza today. All right, um, so P if and only if Q, P, P is equivalent to Q, right? And when we made up the truth table for this, If you write the truth table for each of those equivalences and and them, we got this. Right? So, so the essential fact is that P and Q are either both false or both true. They always have the same truth value. And there's never a case where one is true and the other is not. So that's equivalence. Okay? Implication is a weaker statement. It simply says if P is true, then Q is true. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, I think our intuition mostly works for this. It's one of the few areas where, where if we kind of think about it in, in terms of our usual understanding of if then, um, that actually seems to work. Um, but logically, right, you can just think of it as this biconditional being like this, right? So a plain conditional is just saying this, a biconditional is saying this, and also that. So it's in some sense a stronger statement. We need something else to be true as well. And I think there's some homework questions that ask you to explore that. All right, other questions?
So we worked with truth tables. We wrote up truth tables for some of these, these statements. And there's a homework question that asks you to do that for various um, statements involving propositional variables and ands and ors and nots and things like that. Um, so let's look at some, some peculiar um, equivalences. So given any proposition P, and so the subject here is tautologies and fallacies. So given any proposition P, if we look at the truth value of P ended with not P, we're asking, is P true and also not P true? Well, for not P to be true, for this to be true, P would have to be false. All right, so there's two possibilities here, right? P can be either false or true. Not P is going to be true if P is false and vice versa. And so if we take P and we end it with not P, this is false and true is false. This is true and false is false. This is always false. All right, so we can say that this expression is equivalent to the proposition false. Doesn't matter what the value of P is, this will always evaluate to the same thing as this, which is false. All right, so, so this can be called a fallacy. Okay, it's something that's never true. Uh oh, we got Skynet amped up with quantum computing. Cool. All right. Um, so this this is a fallacy. The flip side of this, for any proposition p, if I construct p or not p. Let me just extend my my truth table. False or true is true. True or false is true. This is equivalent to true. So this is a tautology. It's a statement that's logically equivalent to true. All right, so those are two particular types of equivalences. Something can be, can be equivalent to true or can be equivalent to false, okay? equivalent to true, it's a tautology. If it's equivalent to false, it's a fallacy, or sometimes we'll say it's a contradiction. And contradictions are really important in, in logic because sometimes we're going to try to prove something, and if in trying to prove X, we can prove a contradiction, we know that X can't be true. Let me put that more precisely. Suppose we assume X is true, and then we argue logically and we eventually prove that some contradiction is true. The only thing that could possibly have gone wrong if we didn't make any errors along the way was our starting point. X could not have been true. And so we'll explore proof by contradiction, where we basically assume X and we argue logically until we get to a fallacy and we prove that a fallacy is true at that point, we can conclude X must not be true. X must be false. It's a really powerful proof, te proof technique. Uh, I have a question about the proper use of parentheses when it comes to uh, writing out these essentially uh, equations that this would be followed. Okay. So in your first time, the first part you wrote out was P and not P. Should we have the first P in parentheses, or is it okay to write it how you later did, where it was a P and not P? Yeah, I mean, this, this is perfectly fine. In reality, this would probably be fine too. Because there's nothing we can mean except P or with the negation of P, right? But extra parentheses don't hurt, okay? It's kind of a coding habit. 
this this makes it a little clearer right and and sometimes you know you might see me do that just to make it clear that we have two things that we're taking the disjunction of one of them is this one of them is that so more never hurts but but as long as it's unambiguous you're okay Does that make sense Okay, cool. Oh no, we have Schrodinger's cat popping up in chat now. I think. Maybe not, though. We can talk about Schrodinger's cat sometime. I have a lot of things I like to say about that. Alright, so, so tautologies and fallacies. Um... And logical equivalences. So we can show logical equivalency by using a truth table, right? If you have two expressions, you want to show their equivalent, write out the truth tables. If they're the same in every possible combination of the input values, then they're logically equivalent. All right, so let's talk about identities. And here you're going to want to use your textbook page 58 has all of these things written out um, the laws of logic so there's these basic logic laws um, commutative associative distributive identity and so on and so forth um, so these are good to know right these are these are good to write down because it will force you to you know add them to your muscle memory and put them on on part of a page of notes um, we're going to use these a lot Okay, and some of these are fairly obvious. For example, commutative laws, we sort of think of the universe as being commutative anyway. Um, so, so the commutative law usually isn't too um, startling. So this is page 58 in the text. Um, P or Q is equivalent to Q or P. And sometimes you see the double arrow written like this, right? This is a, a biconditional, right? It's, it's basically saying logical equivalence. Um, it's the way the textbook writes this. So it's saying that this, P or Q, is equivalent to Q or P. And we sort of expect that, right? The order in which we, we or two things shouldn't affect the truth value in the end. The same thing with anding. P and Q is equivalent to Q and P. So that's not too startling to us usually. Let me bring my chat window back. All right. Um, associative laws means we can change the parentheses around. We can do things um, in whatever grouping we want. So if we're oring three things, we can or the first two and then or with the third, or we can or the second and third and then or with the first. And the same with anding. Okay, most things are associative. Um, subtraction is an exception. 2 minus 3 quantity minus 4 is different from 2 minus the quantity 3 minus 4, for example. All right, distribution, we expect this from algebra, right? So P anded with Q or R, we can distribute that and and get P and Q, and then P and R, and we can OR those together. And this turns into alphabet soup pretty quickly, right? But, but write this down a few times, use it a few times even better, and it, it starts to feel pretty natural, right? Um, we're just distributing this or, so P or this stuff, while well, we can take P or it with this, and we can take P or it with that, and then we can take the conjunction of those two. All right, identity laws, these are useful. P or it with false is P, so the book's using zero for false, one for true. That's an engineering 250 thing, right? So any proposition ORed with false has exactly the same truth value as just the proposition. And any proposition ANDED with 1 has the same truth value as the proposition. And if you want to be a little more formal about those, Right? Any proposition P is either false or true. False ORed with false is false. True ORed with false is true. And so this and this have exactly the same truth values. 
false anded with true is false, fal uh, true anded with true is true. And so this and this also have the exact same truth value, so those are logically equivalent. All right, I just have to throw this in. Schrodinger's cat. What if Schrodinger's cat has a cell phone in the box? All right, so these are identities. They're always true. Um, negation laws. So P ended with not P is always false. That's that contradiction that we were using as an example. This was the tautology example. P or not P is always true. All right. Um, idempotent laws. P or P is the same as P. P and P is the same as P. And these make sense, right? So, so if it is, so P is the proposition, it's sunny outside. It's sunny outside or it's sunny outside. The truth value of that is the same as the truth value of the statement, it's sunny outside. Okay, so any, any variable ord with itself is the same as the original variable. Okay, the null laws are kind of the opposite of the identity laws. P anded with false is false. P ord with true is true. All right, and then absorption is a little strange. P and with P or Q is the same as P. And we can show this using a truth table, but we can also think about this logically. What is this statement over here saying? Well, let's just think about it. There's two possibilities. P can be true or false. If P is false, then this conjunction cannot possibly be true because we're taking false and we're adding it with something. It doesn't matter what the value of this is. If P is false, this whole thing is false. On the other hand, if P is true, well, this side of the conjunction is true, and true or with anything will be true, so this side of the conjunction is true, so we're taking the conjunction of two true things, that's going to be true. So if P is true, all of this is true. If P is false, all of this is false. So this is logically equivalent to P. And the cool thing about this is Q does not matter. Q could be my dog knows how to speak Italian, right? Doesn't matter if that's true or false. This proposition over here is logically equivalent to that proposition. And same thing over here. This is the dual P ord with P and Q is equivalent to P. So sometimes we're trying to show equivalence. We can break something into this form and we don't know a whole lot about Q. We can toss it out. It turns out it's a red herring. Uh, let's see, is that a less than sign in the second null law? Um, that's a typo. All right, that, that less than sign should not be there. I never noticed that before. <laughs> All right, so that's a typo. PN0 is 0, P or 1 is 1. Thank you for pointing that out. All right, and De Morgan's Law, we know and love, right? That's good old Engineering 250 and other stuff. So the negation of P or Q is the end of the negation of P and Q. And those are logically equivalent, and here's the dual. And then double negation or involution, so not not P is the same as P. All right, so that's a good set of, of logical identities. Um, and we can use those to, to simplify expressions and change things from one form to another. So let's look at an example of um, using these identities. All right, so we're, we're going to work on a funny logic problem here. Um, so this is an example. So let's show that the negation of, I'm going to put in lots of parentheses here, P or 
not P and Q is logically equivalent to not P and not Q. Now why would we do this? We don't just wake up one day and say, I wonder if this is equivalent to that. Let me try and show it, okay? What we're doing is presumably we're working on some kind of logic problem and we've replaced you know, certain things, certain uh, statements with these propositional variables. And we're trying to show, you know, if porcupines are not allergic to raisins, then I can solve the energy crisis. Okay. And so we've changed it into, um, into this, this language of propositional calculus. And now we're going to use these identities, right, to, to try to show that this is equivalent to that. All right. So I'm going to bring up for the first time, um, but definitely not the last time, um, an important note about showing equalities. So it's, it's very tempting when we're looking at a problem like this to start doing things to this and start doing other things to that and eventually come up with two things that are clearly equal to each other. Okay, we're not allowed to do that. To show that this is equivalent to that, we can't simply do things to both sides and then come up with something where both sides are equal. It's tempting, but it's not a valid proof. And the exact details of why that's invalid will come in another few lectures. But let me give you a sort of silly example where you can get to an incorrect conclusion by doing that. So this is a bad example. Um, so this is a false proof. So prove that 1 is equal to 2. All right. Uh, let x equal 1. Let y equal x plus 1 equals 2. And I'm going to prove that x equals y. Well, I'm going to multiply both sides by a and show that ax equals ay, right? And this is for any a in the real numbers. Well, 0 is a real number. So let a equal 0, so 0 times x is equal to 0 times y. And what 0 times x, 0, and what 0 times y, 0. 0 equals 0. Hey, I'm done. I just proved 1 equals 2. All right? Therefore, 1 equals 2. Okay? Now, it's pretty easy to look at this and know that something is wrong with my proof technique. But it's, it's the same thing that it's tempting to do with something like this. I'll throw De Morgan's rule on this and come up with something else, and I'll throw De Morgan on here and come up with something else, and eventually I'll come up with, you know, P and not Q is equivalent to P and not Q, and I'm good to go, right? But that same approach to proving something lets you prove, for example, that 1 equals 2. I don't know if that would make our life easier or, or more difficult. I guess it would be easier because we could all drop out of math class. Um, but it would make building bridges harder. All right, so, um, so what's going wrong here? What I've proven is that if 1 equals 2, then 0 equals 0. Right? I started off by saying, let's suppose that 1 equals 2, and I did valid mathematical logical things, and eventually I got down here, I proved that if 1 equals 2, then 0 equals 0. And that is a correct statement. If 1 equals 2, then I could multiply both sides by 0, and that would force me to conclude 0 equals 0. But just because this is true, we do not know that the converse is true. We saw the converse is not always equivalent. 
So I don't know from this that I can say if zero equals zero, then one equals two. But that's what I just tried to do, right? I said because zero equals zero, one is equal to two. That doesn't follow logically. All right, we'll come back to this a bunch of times because we'll see we'll see a lot of of examples where um, where we find ourselves doing this unintentionally. Okay, but I just thought I'd mention it right here because. Um, I'm going to show this in a very particular way, and it's not going to be by doing the same things to both sides. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with this left side. And using my laws of logic, these things, I'm going to show that this is equivalent to something else. Okay, so up here, this, this is a proof, by the way, right? Um, so, um, this is a valid proof of our given problem. All right, so we're asked to show that this is equivalent to that. Okay, I don't know that this is true yet. I can write it down because I said show that this is true. If I didn't say show, if I wrote that down, I just lost all my points. Because I wrote something down without proving it. I don't know if this is true or not. So if you're asked to prove that this is equivalent to that, you're allowed to write down prove that this is equivalent to that. We could also make a proposition. Let, let x be the proposition that this is equivalent to that. That's okay. But I cannot simply write down this is equivalent to that unless I've proven it. All right, so I got to write this down because I said show that. Everything that I write has either got to be assume or let's show that this is true or it's got to be something that's absolutely true. All right, well, what can I possibly write down that I know is true that won't get me a frowny face from my teacher? Um, I know that this can be written as other things using perhaps these laws of logic. And it's a trial and error thing. It's a puzzle. It's a game. You look at this and you look at the things that you can do to turn one thing into something equivalent. And you say, do any of these apply? Well, if I had like a negation and a negation, right, I could get rid of both of those. I could say that that's equivalent to this. All right. So, um... Given the, the laws of logic, right, what could I, I maybe do what kinds of things could I try to do that might help me deal with this expression over here? So we could try distribution. So distribution says if I have an and with an or in parentheses, I can I can distribute that that first term, right? And it also says that if I have an or of two things that are anded, I can distribute that or. Well, here's p ORed with something and something. I can use distribution. So let's try that. So I'm going to leave my negation symbol out front, and I'm just going to use distribution on this inner part. So this is going to be P or not P, anded with P or Q. So P anded with this stuff is the same as P Sorry, P ORed with this stuff is the same as P ORed with the first term, anded with P ORed with the second term. And my reason for this is distribution. All right, 
So, so I've written something down which I believe is true. I've listed a reason why I believe it's true. And every statement that I write should have a reason saying why it's true. So your goal in writing a proof is that when you're done, you should be able to hand this proof to somebody who understands propositional logic and they can go through and nod their head and they'll reach the same conclusion that you reached. So I'm making small steps, one step at a time, and I'm listing the reason why that step leaves me with a true statement. This is the distributive law. All right, cool. Um, so we've got that statement. What could we do with that? Uh, let me pull this over. All right, so we've got this statement over here. We've got our laws of logic here. Let's distribute again. Okay, um, let's see. Or de Morgan's law. So we could distribute this with an and with two ors. We could use de Morgan's law to get rid of this negation. Um, somebody else said um, the negation law. So what's the negation law? P or not P is equivalent to one, to true. Well, we've got a P or not P sitting inside here. So these, these are all things we could use. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go with negation because I think it's going to make things simpler. It's going to get rid of some of my terms. All right. So let's, um, let's apply negation. So I'm going to, what, what I should do is I should write this down over here and say that that's equivalent to something else. What I'm going to do is, you know, this trick we learn in school, which is I'm just going to continue this big, long equivalence. I'm going to be saying this is equivalent to that, which is also equivalent to this thing I'm about to write. Okay, so I'm going to use uh, negation. I'm going to say P or not P is true. So this is the negation of true ended with P or Q. And the reason for that is the negation law. All right, so we've got T ended with P or Q. What can we do with that? Identity law, I like it. Identity law says P ended with one is equal to P. All right, with one small detail, the identity law says P and true is equal to P. But I don't have P and true, I have true and P. The identity law is only saying if I take some proposition, I and it with true, I get my original proposition. But here I have true and it with something. So technically, we need to use the commutative law. Now, in practice, where I'm fine on a test or on a homework, if, you know, you take a little bit of a liberty with these identities and you, you know that P and 1 is the same as 1 and P. But I'm putting it down here as a separate step just to make it clear everything that's going on here, right? Technically, before I can use this identity law, I need to use commutivity to change this into the same form. All right, and we're thinking court of law here. We're thinking we're going in front of a skeptic who doesn't believe that this is equivalent to that, and we're trying to convince them. So we want to do everything completely and rigorously. So this is equivalent to the negation of P or Q. That's the identity law. And now we can go back to an earlier suggestion, which is to go ahead and use De Morgan's. So De Morgan's theorem, De Morgan's law, tells us that the negation of a disjunction is the same thing as the conjunction of the negation of the two propositions. So this is equivalent to negation of P ended with the negation of Q. 
That's De Morgan. And so what have we shown? We've shown that this is equivalent to that, which 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 is equivalent to that. We're implicitly using this transitive property. If that's equivalent to that, and 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 that's equivalent to that, then this thing is equivalent to that thing. Okay, we don't have that spelled out. We don't have to spell that out. So that's given for us. So from all of this, we can conclude this is equivalent to that. That's a little dis different from distribution. Um, that's really transitivity of, of the equivalence relation. But it feels kind of similar to distribution in some way. All right, so, so we did not use this in our proof. We simply started with this, and we showed by using these laws that this is equivalent to that. That's exactly what we were trying to prove, though. Right? We've just proven that this is equivalent to that, which is what we were asked to demonstrate. So we can write QED, which is Latin for, which is what we were asked to demonstrate, or what we sought to demonstrate. So that's the conclusion of our proof. And it's very rigorous, and it's very watertight. And, and if you take this to someone who understands these laws of logic and logical reasoning, they will reach the same conclusion you did. Oh, okay, this is a true statement. That is equivalent to that. QED is Latin for, my Latin is like decades old, but um, which is what was to be demonstrated. Or quite easily done, if you're a math geek. All right, so that's that's a a very detailed proof, um, and if if you're doing this, you know, on on a final exam or something, you want this level of detail. But if you're doing this for yourself, if you're trying to know if something's equivalent to something else, right, you might you might skip some steps. You might combine some steps, right? I would almost certainly combine the commutivity and the identity law into one step here, um, and. And at this point, you know, I would immediately know that this was equal to that. Um, but sometimes, you know, you try to combine steps or skip steps, and sometimes you make mistakes. So, so this is a way to, you know, kind of double check your, your thought argument and be sure that you're not skipping over something, you know, or doing something that, that's a fallacy by mistake. All right, so other questions about that? All right, the other thing to note is that there's, there's other ways we could have done this, right? We could, have, um, we could have started off by using De Morgan's theorem on this left piece and gotten not P added with not this stuff and then used De Morgan's theorem on the negation of this expression and turned that into a series of ors and we would have ended up with a not not P again over here, right? And... and Presumably, eventually gotten it down to this expression again. And in general, you know, there's, there's more than one way to do these proofs. And there's some things we could do that make things worse, right? There's some turns we might make that actually end up giving us a more complex expression. But in general, we're trying to simplify and get down to an expression that... that can be turned into the thing we're trying to show equivalence to. But that's not a precise algorithm, right? There's, there's not a set of steps we follow, and at the end of that process, we've got our answer, okay? And so this is, this is a little bit like when you take physics, right? You can understand physics. Physics, mechanics, one equation, F equals MA. That's it. That's like, you know, the bulk of, of physics. Um, but... Knowing F equals MA doesn't tell you what to do when you got the dang cylinder rolling down the inclined plane with this degree of friction. You've got a bird sitting at the bottom singing, right? 
Um, it's, it's being able to take what you know and apply it to the particular situation. And that's what's going on with these proofs. There's no algorithm I can give you which says, you know, first do this, then do that. It's really, you know, look at what you have, look at the, the laws that you can work with, and see if there's something you can do that feels like it might, might make progress. And the more you do this, the better you get at it, just like physics, right? The first few problems that I tried to solve in physics, no idea what to do. I understood the lectures. I'd go to the TA and they'd work the problems out for me. It made perfect sense. But when I would sit down with a problem, I had no idea how to proceed because I was looking for a set of steps and there was no set of steps. It's really taking what you know and seeing what applies and in what way and trying to change the problem around into something that, that you do know how to do. And that's kind of the nature of programming, right? We, we want to write a program to, I don't know, you know, take the list of students and, and build a spreadsheet that has some information in it combined with some other information. And I don't know how to do that, you know. I don't have, have some algorithm taped to my wall which says, you know, first type integer i, semicolon. Um, you got to mess around with it. But our brains are set up so that the more you do this, the better we get at figuring out how to do this the next time. So it's a practice thing, okay? Um, and we'll get lots of practice in here doing proofs. Um, and it's kind of like a game, right? Um, not if it's, you know, due in, in 20 seconds. But, you know, if you've got some time and you can work at it in kind of a, a relaxed mindset, it's sort of like a puzzle, right? Which can be kind of cool. All right, so um, let's leave that for a little while and let's talk about something new. So um, the subject here is quantifiers. And quantifiers are another way that we can build new propositions from old propositions. And there's a pair of quantifiers we're going to work with. There's the universal quantifier and there's the existential quantifier. So let's start with the universal quantifier. So the universal quantifier is written as an upside down A. And quantifiers usually deal with what we'll call a family of propositions. So we've been dealing with simple propositions like P and Q and R. P is the proposition that it's sunny. Q is the proposition that my dog knows how to speak Italian and so on. Um, so those, those are individual propositions, but we can also define a family of propositions. So for example, let P of X be the proposition x is less than x squared. And I'm going to define this for x being an integer. So what I've defined here is an infinite family of propositions. For any element of this set, for any integer x, p of x is a proposition. So let's write out what some of these propositions are. P of 0 is the proposition that 0 is less than 0 squared. P of 1 is the proposition 1 is less than 1 squared. P of 5 is the proposition 5 is less than 5 squared. P of negative 2 is the proposition negative 2 is less than negative 2 squared. And so on. So this defines more than one proposition. In this case, it defines an infinite number of propositions. And some of these propositions are true, some of them are false. P0 is false, 0 is not less than 0. P1 is also false, 1 is not less than 1. 
But P5 is true, 5 is less than 25. P negative 2 is true, negative 2 is less than 4. And most of these propositions are true. It's really P0, P1 um, are false. P of negative 1 is the proposition negative 1 is less than negative 1 squared. Well, that's actually true. Negative 1 is smaller than 1. So most of these are true. 0 and 1 are false. All right. So quantifiers, we're going to be talking about families of propositions. So when I say P of x, P parentheses x, um, where x is an integer, for example, think infinite, infinite family of propositions. Okay, P0, P1, P2, P negative 5, P17, each of those is a proposition. All right, so what do we do with quantifiers? We can say something like this um, for all x contained in z, um, P of x. So this reads for all x in z, p of x is true. All right. So, so p of x was the proposition that that x was less than x squared. Let me make another proposition. Let q of x be the proposition x is equal to x squared. Okay, this is the proposition that for all x in z, p of x is true. It's a proposition, it's a declarative statement with a truth value. For all x in z, p of x is true. We could, we could spell this out for all x in z, um, x is less than x squared. That's what this proposition says. It turns out to be a false proposition. Because for x equals 0 or x equals 1, this is not true. But this is still a proposition. All right, here's another proposition for all x in z p of x or q of x. I'm going to put these in parentheses just to make it clearer. So right, p of x is the proposition x is less than x squared. q of x is the proposition x is equal to x squared. Well, it turns out for all integers x, either x is less than x squared or x is equal to x squared. Right, in particular, 0, 1, and minus 1. So this is a true proposition. All right, so, so for all x. And we really need to be clear when we use this universal quantifier what the, the set of possible values are. If I just say for all x, real numbers, positive integers, integers from the set 4, 5, 6, right? the value of this is going to change depending on what the possible values of x are. So when we're talking about for all x, we've absolutely got to know what does that encompass? What's the full range of all the possible x's? All right, so that's the universal quantifier. The other one we're going to work with is the existential quantifier. So that's a backwards E, and that reads as there exists an x. All right, so there exists an x, and it's usually there exists an x such that something. So let's use the same family of propositions. P of x is the proposition x is less than x squared. Um, there exists an x such that 
P of X. such that x is less than x squared. And again, we've got to be clear what the universe is here. So I would, I would more formally write this. There exists an x in z such that p of x. And that's absolutely a true proposition. There does exist an x in z such that x is less than x squared. For example, 10. 10 is less than 10 squared. All right, so that's the existential quantifier. And the universal quantifier, existential quantifier, these are in other ways we can create new propositions out of old propositions. All right, so let's look at some examples. For all x contained in z, x equals absolute value of x, or x is less than 0. So for all x contained in z, x equals the absolute value of x, or x is less than 0. Is that a true or a false proposition? One vote. Two votes. Give me one more vote and we'll call it a law. Okay, there we go. Votes coming in. True. Yeah, this is absolutely true. That's the nature of an absolute value, right? If x is negative, then this whole disjunction is true. If x is bigger than or equal to zero, we know that the absolute value of x is just x. So this is true for all x. Uh, there exists an x and z such that um, x is bigger than absolute value of x. Is that true? Right, that turns out to be false. And it may not be obvious, but if you if you play with it a little bit, right, if x is a positive number, then x is equal to its absolute value. If x is 0, it's equal to its absolute value. If x is negative, x is going to be smaller than the absolute value of x, because absolute value is always bigger than or equal to 0. So this is never true. There doesn't even exist a single x for which this is true. There exists an x such that x squared equals 5. We have no way to answer that unless we know what the possible values of x are. So if I say there exists an x in the set of integers, this is false. If I say there exists an x in the set of real numbers, this is true. Square root of 5. So this domain is going to be critical to these existential and universal quantifiers. All right. Let me show you a really, really powerful example of this that we'll spend about a week on, probably a couple of weeks from now. Um, for all x contained in the set of positives, p of x. All right, for all values of x in the set of positive integers, so for x is 0, 1, 2, for is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on, p of x is true. 
Okay, this is logically equivalent to the following. Well, if x is 0, this must be true, because we're saying for, sorry, if x is 1, this must be true, because 1 is a positive integer, and we're saying for all positive integers, p of x is true. So in particular, p of 1 must be true. Also, if x is equal to 2, that's a positive integer, so p of 2 must be true. And similarly, p of 3 and p of 4 and so on. So this is a nice succinct way of saying this big long infinite conjunction that p of 1 is true and p of 2 and p of 3 and p of 4 and p of 5 and so on. All right, there exists an x in the set of positive integers such that p of x is true. This means there's some x, could be 1, could be 2, could be 1,000, but there's at least one x where p of x is true. So if we write that out, that means either p of 1 is true or p of 2 or p of 3 or p of 4 or something but this infinite disjunction must have a value of true. There's at least one x where one of these terms is going to be true, which means that the or of all of them is going to be true. So this is a nice, succinct way of writing this infinite disjunction. So that's a hint of what we're going to call mathematical induction. And that's something we'll probably get to in about two weeks. It's a really powerful proof technique. And it's going to basically use this kind of, of equivalence. All right, so that's a preview of coming attractions. All right, let's look at some other equivalences. So now, now we're just going to start playing, okay? So, um, for example, for all x, and I'm not going to worry about the domain here. We're going to assume we're specifying some domain. But these statements I'm writing will be true whatever domain we end up restricting x to. So for all x, p of x and q of x, Well, this is saying for any x that I pick in the domain, p is true and also q is true. So if I'm working over integers and I set x equal to 23, this says p of 23 is true and also q of 23 is true. So in particular, for any x I pick, p of x is going to be true. It's got to be because this conjunction is true. And the only way this can be true is if that's true and also that is true. So over here, I'm going to write for all x, p of x. And over here, I'm going to write for all x, q of x. And if this is true, then both of these must be true. And if this is true and this is true, then absolutely that's true also. Because if p of x is always true and q of x is always true, then p and q is always true. So these two things are logically equivalent. So for all x, p and q is equivalent to for all x, p and for all x, q. Well, that's kind of nice. Because it means we can... Basically, that's a distribution, yeah. Um, 
and we need to be a little careful, but but intuitively, deep down, we can think of it kind of like that, yeah. All right, let's try the other quantifier. Are these two equivalent to each other? So it turns out these are not equivalent. Yeah, we got some pulses up there. Right? This is this is not something that distributes. So let's let's look at an example of this. Um, so let p of x be the proposition x is bigger than zero. Let q of x be the proposition x is less than 0. Does there exist an x such that x is bigger than 0? Yes. Does there exist, exist an x such that x is less than 0? Yes. So the conjunction here is true. But does there exist an x such that x is bigger than 0 and x is less than 0? No. So this side is false. So these two things are not logically equivalent to each other. There may be particular propositions for which these are equivalent, and there may be particular domains of x for which the equivalence holds, but in general this is not equivalent to that. Because to have an x for which p is true does not have to be the same x for which q is true. We're only requiring that there is some x where q is true. And there has to be some x where p is true. But this is much stronger. This is requiring that there is a single x for which both p and q are true. So that's not equivalent. I'm going to loosen my parentheses a little bit because I think we know what, what we mean. How about this? There exists an x such that p of x or there exists a, an x such that q of x. That's an x. There exists an x such that p of x or there exists an x such that q of x. And over here, let's do there exists an x such that p of x or q of x. Equivalent or not equivalent? Definitely equivalent. Awesome. And actually, just knowing that there exists an x where p of x is true tells us there exists an x where p of x or q of x is true. So if this is true, then this is definitely true. If that's true, that's definitely true. And this says either this is true or that is true. So yeah, that's definitely equivalent. All right, let's play with some other variations on this. For all x, 
not q of x. In other words, for all x, q is false. So for any x I pick, q of x is false. That's equivalent to saying there is no x for which q is true. So does there exist an x such that q of x? No. So those are equivalent statements. For all x, q is false. There does not exist an x such that q is true. Those are the same thing. So we can move this negation outside, and when we do that, we have to flip our universal quantifier into an existential quantifier. That's a little weird, but it's kind of fun. There exists an x such that not q of x. This says there's at least one x for which q is false. So suggesting that for all x, q is true, that must be false. So these are equivalent. So there is at least one x for which q is false. This says for all x, q is true. And we just said that's not the case. There's at least one x for which q is false. So this statement is false. That's equivalent to that. All right, we can also nest these quantifiers. So we can say something like this. For all x, there exists a y such that x plus y equals 0. And I'm going to work over, um, over the set of integers for these next few examples. So I'm not going to write them in here the way I should for all x. In z, there exists a y in z such that. But for all x, there exists a y such that x plus y equals 0. Is that true or false? And it can help to add parentheses, maybe. Yeah, this is definitely true. This is saying if you give me an x, I can find a y such that x plus y equals 0. Well, in particular, I can just set y equal to negative x. So this is logically equivalent to true. All right, there exists a y such that for all x, x plus y is equal to 0. Is that true or false? Yeah, that's coming up false in chat. This would say that there is some magic number y such that if you take any integer and add it to y, you get 0. Well, there is no such number. There's no number that, that always gives you 0 when you add it to anything. If this was multiplication, it would be true. But for addition, this is false. So here's a breakdown of commutivity, right? These, these operators, the universal and the existential quantifiers, these things don't commute. You potentially change the value of, of the proposition, right? And keep coming back to this idea, this is a proposition. This is a declarative statement. It's a proposition that, that um, is either true or false. Right, turns out to be false, turns out to be true. All right, is this making sense? There's, there's no one punchline here, right? It's really just sort of working with these definitions and getting familiar with them. 
Um, and, and also the idea that, you know, some of this stuff is not intuitive. Um, some of it we have to really kind of, of work with, um, with the definitions. So for all x, for all y, x times y equals y times x. That's true. That's the statement of the commutative law of multiplication. And that's a pretty succinct way to write it. There exists an x and there exists a y such that x is equal to y plus 1. Well, yeah, that's totally true. I could let x equal 1 and y equal 0. This is totally false. There's no x and y such that x plus y equals x plus y plus 5. All right, so we can do some fairly powerful things with this. Right, this is a true proposition. And it succinctly says the product of two positive numbers is positive. For all x and for all y, if x is bigger than 0 and y is bigger than 0, then x times y is bigger than 0. So when you try to, to work through these things, sometimes it's useful to break it down into pieces. So, so I can throw some big parentheses around here and say for all y, this proposition is true. Okay, I'm going to call this thing P of x. So P of X is the proposition for all Y if X is bigger than 0 and Y is bigger than 0 then X times Y is bigger than 0. Okay, this is a family of propositions. Again, I'm assuming we're working over the integers or something. This is a family of propositions. P of 0 is a proposition that for all Y if 0 is bigger than 0 and y is bigger than 0, then uh, 0 times y is bigger than 0. P of 5 is the proposition that for all y, if 5 is bigger than 0 and y is bigger than 0, then 5 times y is bigger than 0. All right. For any x, I get another proposition. This is the proposition that for all x, P of X is true. And let's just think about that. Um, let's think about P of negative 1. P of negative 1 is the proposition that for all Y, if negative 1 is bigger than 0 and Y is bigger than 0, then uh, negative 1 times Y is bigger than zero. Well, is this a true proposition or not? I've claimed that, that for all x, p of x is true. Is this a true proposition for all y? 
And it turns out this is true. And I'll tell you why. So let's just, just write this one out. For all y, if negative 1 is bigger than 0 and y is bigger than 0, then negative 1 times y is bigger than 0. The reason this is a true proposition, right, I'm claiming this is true for all y. Why is this true for all y? Because this is false, which means this ended with this is false. And so we're saying for all y, false implies negative 1 times y is bigger than 0. Well, go back to the truth table for conditional statements. This is logically equivalent to true. If your hypothesis is false, your conditional statement is true. And that was that, that quirky row in our truth table where we said, you know, if P then Q, and in the row where P was false, the conditional statement turned out to be true. Right, so because the hypothesis is false, this conditional is true. So in fact, we're, we're totally in our rights to say for all x, for all y, this is a true statement. And that's good, right? Because we believe this is a true statement. We believe if we pick any integers x and y, if x is positive and y is positive, then their, their product is positive. All right, so that's, that's another view of the if-false business from, uh, from a few days ago. All right, so that's a good piece of weirdness to leave you on for a Friday. Um, Monday, we're going to go on to the next page of the text, which is... Um, which is this business of um, implications and equivalences. So we're going to go on to page 59. We're going to work with these things. And these are going to be the ways that we can form logical arguments. And we're going to start with statements like, you know, if it's sunny, I'm going to go for a run. And it's sunny, therefore I'm out running. Um, and we'll see how to do these proofs. So this, this will be the sort of most formal section of our discussion on proofs. Um, and we'll do this for a good chunk of next week. And then we're going to change gears for a little bit and talk about number theory. And we'll spend a week talking about number theory leading up to and including talking about public key crypto systems, in particular RSA. We'll see how that works. We'll talk about prime numbers, Fermat's last theorem and good stuff like that. And then when we're done with that, we're going to come back and we're going to talk more about proofs. And that's when we'll get into mathematical induction. So we'll go deep into proofs next week. We'll take a little bit of a break after that, and then we'll come back to proofs, tie it into computer science. All right, that's a bit of a preview of where we're going. All right, have a fantastic weekend. I'll be in office hours from 2 to 3 today. Um, enjoy the nice weather out there. Stay safe, and I'll see you on Monday.